Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we've entitled this Visionary Leadership, Building Excellence from the Ground Up. My name is Jack Zenger. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Joe Folkman, uh, whose brief biography is also up on the screen there with you. We're also joined by a third colleague, uh, Jill Mancini, who is one of our regional vice presidents and will serve today as the chat host. So if you have questions that you would like answers to, things that aren't clear as we proceed through this webinar, please feel free to you know, type into your screen on, on your, your chat screen those questions that you have. Jill, you might just kind of wave to the group and say hi and so that they'll know who you are and, and what you do. Thanks, Jack. And I do look forward to hearing from you today and we'll get back to you with the answers you seek. So thanks for participating. All right. As we begin today's uh, webinar, we began by kind of taking a, a broad look at the business press, at the, the factors that seem to be impinging on organizations that were collectively creating the need for better leaders. And they begin with this very fast changing business environment that we're in. Uh, it includes things like the, the constant uh, trend toward globalization and the intricacies of having a global uh, network. Um, a third force that we saw frequently referred to is digital transformation and the whole advent of AI and how organizations are attempting to migrate to a more digital uh, format. You know, Jack, a few years ago, we measured digital skills for one organization. And, you know, it was really surprising the impact that had on a leader's effectiveness. But we also found surprising, not surprisingly, that the older a leader was, the, the lower their rating on digital skills. Uh, 100% of those in their 20s and 30s were <laughs> above average, and, and that only 22% of those who were 60 or above were above average. I can really identify with that, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I am the embodiment of that phenomenon. We're learning here. Oh, man. A fourth very strong factor has been this... Uh, Concerned about employee engagement and the in the effect that that has on the company's retention rate, and, and certainly remember, we're seeing a lot of interest. Remember that quiet quitting thing that went on last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. And the next thing we saw in the press was a a lot of reference toward the need for greater adaptive adaptability for leaders to be able to practice more skillful change management. Uh, and this whole area of change was a, a big issue. Um, the next one that we saw a lot of reference to was uh, this emphasis on what some would call soft skills and others would observe as are the hard skills. Uh, but there's certainly been a, a added emphasis on leaders' ability to relate effectively with people uh, and to improve the just general level of their people skills. One of our colleagues in the Bay Area said that the number one skill that was really needed in the Bay Area was relationship building and interpersonal skills and emotional intelligence, that yeah. that was uh, you know, they, they, it was easy to find geeks, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was hard to find those with soft skills, you know, that that's, that's really the, the thing that's missing in a lot of organizations. Yeah. Uh, we saw a lot of references to uh, innovation and the um, importance of organizations constantly seeking new products new processes, new services, uh, this, this incessant need for higher levels of creativity and innovation. The one thing that never goes away is uh, the, the focus that organizations have on 
having high ethical standards. And that just does not ever depart. Uh, and we also, having endured a, a major pandemic that upended a lot of things for nearly all organizations, uh, while we never know what's going to happen in terms of a future crisis, uh, we can all pretty well guess that there will be one uh, and that uh, we haven't seen the end of, of challenges like COVID or some other major uh, crisis, such as the, the, the outbreak of war in the Middle East or other, other parts of the world. And you the know, final one, I'm sorry, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention that, that that crisis the pandemic brought on, uh, a lot of people expected to see a decline in leadership effectiveness, a decline in engagement. Our studies, we found actually leadership effectiveness improved and engagement went up. So, boy, we did a people people did a great job and 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 it would, took a lot of effort and stress, but I think they we we did pretty well through that crisis. Okay, and the final one that we saw a lot of reference to was the importance of talent development. That in this uh, changing world, that to help our our team members stay abreast of, of what they needed in terms of skills and capabilities, uh, organizations needed to focus on talent development. So, what we would like to invite you to do, if you would, would be to think about those 10 forces and which ones provide the, the most significant challenges to your organization. So if you would just kind of weigh in and say, you know, what are the four that we find to be of, you know, greatest uh, impact on us? So mm -hmm. please, if you would, weigh in. What do you think the winner is going to be? <laughs> okay. Oh, my. Um, digital transformation, I think, is going to be one. I think talent development will be one. I think creativity, innovation. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll soon find out. What let do you think, put, Joe? Let me put my vote in for soft yeah. skills. Soft skills. <laughs> you think that's going to be up there? All right. Well, we'll see here pretty quickly. So. Um, our behind the scenes staff is going to build us a little screen here and looks to me like employee retention comes out uh, pretty high on the list there. And, um, Amazing. then yeah. followed by adaptability and change management, changing business environment. Well, thank you. It, it looks like, uh, maybe with the exception of globalization, uh, all of those things are impacting us and are things that have been driving forces for the importance of developing better leaders in the organization. So Joe, talk about that. Well, if we look at, at and this uh, is actually a study we ran where we looked at 100,000 leaders, uh, global, uh, this is not only U.S., but across the globe. And we look at the connection between how effective a leader is, you know, their skills and abilities and engagement. What we see is, and again, if, if the leader's skills are not very good, if they're, if they're a poor leader, if they're rated pretty negatively, the engagement of their direct reports is at the 21st percentile. Now, if the leader skills are at the 50th percentile, they're right in the middle, they're good, they're not bad, they're good, and engagement goes to the 48th percentile. But if a leader's effectiveness is, is in the top 5%, if they're, if they're a great leader, engagement is at the 85th percentile. And we've seen this so often, we've talked about it so often, and we talked about this connection between leadership effectiveness and engagement, leadership effectiveness and profitability, leadership effectiveness and customer satisfaction, and on and on. I won't go on. But one of the keys that we know that are going to make 
a business more successful is the effectiveness of leaders. And if we can, if we can just have better leaders, we get better organizations. We get more success. And and I don't think anybody doubts this. Everybody wants better leaders. So the question is, well, how do you get better leadership talent? And we we see two options here. <laughs> one is to hire it, right? Find a good one out there somewhere. But the other one is to grow it. And and uh, you know it, what 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 we know about leadership is that you might not have it right now in your organization, but you could have it. You may have potentially great leaders in your organization, but they're not there yet. And and so which do you do? And and again, there's some interesting challenges here because it takes time and resources to recruit new leadership talent. Uh, the World Economics Forum uh, found that the talent competitive index indicates there's a shortage of talent. And so with low supply and high demand, <laughs> that only means that salaries are going to go up. And so it's going to get more expensive for you to hire that talent. Uh, won't have established networks for people that come in and you hire. They can't come in with a network. They don't know people in the organization. They can't rely on their personal relationships because they don't have any. And so they have to build that over time. And, you know, the Corporate Leadership Council reported that, you know, approximately 50% of external hires at the executive level fail in the first 18 months. Now, there's been additional studies on that that come in a little lower, but we never get a study that says hiring is 100% successful. And we're in the business of really suggesting you can grow your leaders. So how do you do that? Yeah, so we certainly don't want to pretend that the decision to grow your leaders rather than hire them from the outside is a is a walk in the park. Uh, we think there are some very interesting challenges with it. Years ago, I remember having a conversation with a woman who was in charge of leadership development for a large Silicon Valley firm. And I said to her, you know, if you were doing all this all over again, what would you do differently? And without hesitation, her, her reply was, Jack would start a lot earlier. Uh, we think the issue of timing is really a crucial one. Most organizations simply wait too long, start too late. The, the, we're, we're kind of missing the, the, the timing uh, kind of uh, dimension. The second one is what that creates is that we have a number of leaders who are not prepared. You know, I've gone on the web a couple of times and asked the, the, you know, the question about what percentage of leaders um, have not had any formal preparation in how to be a manager, how to how to lead before they were put in their in their position. And you know, in all honesty, you see numbers that go from, you know, 40% of all managers who manage three to five people have had zero development prior to being put in that role. Uh, and that goes all the way up to, you know, 80% have not had any uh preparation. Our, our own experience, just for what that's worth, is that we have a large number of people each year going through our, our kind of flagship program, which is a, a 360 degree feedback experience with a creation of a development plan. And what we've found is that over the last few years, the average age of the participants in that program has actually increased. Until now today, if we look at those participants who have gone through our program in the last two years, the average age, 46. That means that about 25% of the leaders in this data set are actually under 40 years of age, 
but 25% are 51 years of age and older. And when we share that data with organizations, the, the people in charge often will kind of wince because that's not what they believe is would be the ideal thing that, that, that we need to be spending more attention and more time and more focus on those who are the younger managers, who are the, the future leaders of the organization. So Joe, uh, yeah. Yeah, so let me build on that. Um, one of the things that we think is a real option here is uh, thinking about developing individual contributors. Now, for a lot of organizations, they feel it's a waste of time. Uh, they would say, gee, well, only the leaders need leadership skills. Our research says something very different. Our research shows that the same skills that make a leader successful would also make an individual contributor successful. We also know that it takes time and experience to develop leadership skills. So starting development earlier in a career helps a person to become an extraordinary leader. If you think about that, people come to work and then uh, they get a job. And then when you think about this number 46, so we wait 20 years <laughs> before we give them <laughs> that, you know, we sort of let them sort of sit there for 20 years when we could be developing them. Uh, now, our assessments of individual contributors can provide a valuable insight and, 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 and information on who really are your high potentials. We've found in different organizations that a lot of people are selected as high potentials, but we measure them in the bottom quartile in terms of their leadership effectiveness. And in one organization, it was 17%. In another, it was 13%. And so getting these assessments early and finding out who has the potential or developing the skills that are needed, and that occurs too, the majority of people in, improve would be really helpful for leaders. So we saw this many years ago, about a decade ago, we saw the need for development of individual contributors. And at that point, we had a competency model and we adapted it to fit the individual contributor. We went in and looked at all the behaviors and we changed some of the behaviors because they were managerial oriented but we made all the behaviors fit the roles and responsibility of individual contributors. And so here's our individual contributor, what we call the extraordinary performer competency model. And if you're familiar with our standard competency model, you'll see really the competencies look very familiar. There's two that we changed quite a lot. And one was, if you look under leading change, we have broad perspective. On the managerial survey, that is strategic perspective. And before, below that, you'll see supports change. And on the, again, the managerial survey, that is champions change. But the majority of the items work for individual contributors as much as they work for a manager. Now, we found this program to be very successful, and we've had thousands of people go through the program. And so what is the result that it shows? Again, our, our observation is, is that skills, if you can improve the skills of individual contributors, it helps them to be more successful. And this is a, a, a validation of that, because what we're looking at here is manager ratings on the 19 individual contributor competencies from the worst, the lowest ratings, first to the ninth percentile, to the best, 90th to the 100th percentile. The bars represent those rated in the top 10% on productivity. And these are results from 7,309 individual contributors. So this is not a small sample. 
But as you look at this, it's really clear that the individual contributors that have the best skills have the highest uh, performance ratings. In other words, they're contributing the most to the organization. Those skills that help a leader to be successful also help an individual contributor to be successful. Now, if we look at which skills are most highly correlated between this performance rating and this, the 19 uh, competencies that we have in the assessment, these are the top 10 competencies. And as you look down the list, establish stretch goals, drive for results, inspires uh, others to high performance, integrity and honesty, taking initiative, technical expertise, solves problems, collaboration, makes decisions, customer and external focus. These are not only competencies that help an individual contributor to be successful, these are competencies that help managers to be successful. Uh, the correlations are all very high and very significant. So what we did was a landmark study and in this study, which is a very longitudinal study, we measured people when they were an individual contributor, okay? And we got a measurement from them as an individual contributor. And then we waited around for a few years until they were promoted into a management position. And then they were given the managerial version of the survey. So we tracked 564 people that went from an individual contributor to a manager. And we looked at the connection between the scores on their individual contributor survey and the results on their managerial survey. And what we found is, is that if a person on their individual contributor survey was in the top quartile, we found as an individual contributor, we found they were in the 70th percentile as a manager. And in addition to that, if they were in the bottom quartile as a manager, they were rated at the 32nd percentile. What is this showing us? What it's showing us is, again, our, our proposal that the skills that make an individual contributor successful are also the skills that make a manager successful. And this is scientific evidence that that is true. You can see the results were highly significant between these two uh, 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 metrics and uh, the F value, you know, that should impress you, but it, it doesn't always impress me as you see that. But it impresses me because that's a huge, a huge thing. Here's what else we found. We had another study we did where we looked at individual contributors who went through a pretest and then 18 to 24 months went through a post test after. And we found that the majority of those individual contributors were able to improve their skills over 18 to 24 months. So, you know, this growth can occur and and but Again, what we're, what we're saying here, the big insight from this is the same skills that help you to be successful as an individual contributor, help you to be successful as a manager. And this is the evidence to demonstrate that. So here's our observation. <laughs> okay, so Joe has just shared with you a lots of very useful statistical data about some long-term longitudinal studies that we've conducted. Let's just kind of all take a big breath and say, okay, what are the very uh, fundamental conclusions from all that? And they are that, first of all, we've been talking for a long time about the importance of having leadership at all levels in the organization. That good leadership doesn't just happen with the most senior people living in the C-suite. It happens all the way down to the to the front line levels of the organization. What we've learned is that individual contributors who were in the top quartile 
were rated significantly more positively later on when they became managers. What we've also learned, though, is that they also were a lot more effective during those years when they were functioning as individual contributors. So the organization really enjoyed higher productivity, higher performance from them as they were engaged in preparing them for their future. And conversely, those individual contributors who were in the bottom quartile, uh, when they became managers, tended to be in the bottom you know, third of those managers that were measured. And so our, our conclusion is that those skills that the organization invests in developing while people are still individual contributors will later, later on impact their effectiveness as managers. So in addition to helping those individual contributors be better people, be better, better professionals in their current role, it's preparing them for the future. And so, no big shock, the best individual contributors end up making the best managers. And therefore, let's the, the broader message we hope everyone walks away from today's webinar with is your organization can kind of jumpstart leadership development by, by beginning at the time when these people are functioning as individual contributors. And you know, Jack, having uh, taught groups of individual contributors, uh, what a wonderful thing. I mean, they love that feedback and it's the first time they've had it and and they want to learn and and boy, what a what a what a great audience. I boy, it, it really does. They love they love the training, they love the development. Yeah. Well, thank you for explaining that because I kind of geeked out on that last slide, but I'm not done yet. <laughs> 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 you know, never. So, so what I did. So let me tell you what I did here. Uh, this looks at 16 of the competencies. Three of the competencies are, were newer and we didn't have as much data on them. So we we looked at 16 of the competencies. And what we did is we correlated the individual contributor to data to the manager data. Now, let me tell you what this reveals. The higher the correlation, the more the, you know, if you were really good as an individual contributor on a particular skill, you tended to be good as a manager on that same skill. The higher the correlation shows that. Now, all the correlations are statistically significant, which really is a resounding uh, validation of the point that we make that the skills that help an individual contributor be more successful are the same skills that make a, a manager more successful. But some of those skills are, are, you know, are more highly correlated. And what that means is, is that, that the same skill is useful as a manager and the lower correlations show that these skills, you know, some of these skills, you know, an individual contributor role is very different from a manager role. Uh, so let's look at, and you know, in the top we have the white, and in the bottom we have the blue. And what we just did is arbitrarily split these in half. Okay, it, you notice that the the correlations don't change that much. But what we wanted to talk about was which skills are going to require some additional work as you become a manager because the role is different. Let me give you an example of that develops others. As an individual contributor, you don't do much of that. But as a manager, you're asked to give a performance review. That is very different from anything you did as an individual contributor. You may have given somebody feedback on their performance or just mentioned to them, or a lot of times you don't say anything. But for instance, champions change. Again, we changed that competency in the individual contributor survey to supports change. And again, as an individual contributor, you're often not given the responsibility to drive a change through the organization. But as a manager, you're oftentimes told that you need to kind of really be a champion of change 
and make sure a change is instituted. So the role is very different. So we're going to take these bottom eight and we're going to talk about the ones, these, these skills and how the role is different and what you need to do differently in these roles as a leader. So Jack, start us off with collaboration and teamwork. You bet. The, the first one is collaboration and teamwork. Uh, I, I think if you just stand back and you see the logic behind this one, when a person moves from being an individual contributor to being now a team leader or a supervisor, uh, it calls for some new behavior, calls for some new skills. Rather than simply you know, attending a team meeting, now you're the one that needs to run the meeting. And so your job is now, rather than just being a recipient of kind of a you know, the, the culture and the whole process, you're now responsible for creating it. And so you need to learn how to run effective meetings. And so you need to also kind of be responsible for, you know, what is the, the tenor and, and the esprit de corps of, of, my, of my group collectively? Rather than kind of sitting back and being passive, you need to be more active and you need to be the one who practices inclusion and has everybody feel like they're they're in the house rather than on the outside of the house looking in through the window. Uh, so this whole notion of collaboration and teamwork is probably the first one that is, and it has the most difference between being an individual contributor and how it correlates to being a manager. Yeah, it's a big it's a big issue. Now, the second one, I've talked a little bit about this, is developing others. And, and again, we're moving from sort of being a colleague to being a person's manager. And, and oftentimes, I've had conversations with <laughs> some people that have been part of a team, and then they were promoted to the team lead. That is really hard. And moving from the I'm, I'm a peer to now I'm the boss. That is really hard. And, and one of the things that the expectation as a manager is you're expected to give feedback, to have a performance review. The, the funny thing about feedback is that when we measure preference for giving positive or negative feedback, for some strange reason, the majority of people tend to give more negative feedback than positive feedback. You know, and it's, it's kind of crazy. And in fact, we found a high percentage of leaders actually avoid giving positive feedback. So, you know, and, and we think, you know, that's all backwards. <laughs> we <laughs> think that if anything, you should give more positive feedback and, 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 you know, and be careful. So really learning about feedback, how to give feedback, the balance between positive and negative, and then kind of, could you be a coach? What does that require? And, and a lot of people really have a, an eye-opening experience about being a coach and, and how to be a better coach. Unfortunately, they've learned about coaching from when they played Little League. <laughs> yeah, right. And the coach was yelling on the side of the field. <laughs> you know, I mean, very directive. But we, we, coaching skills are very different. And to be a colleague and a good coach requires a different set of skills. Lots to learn there. The third one has to do with building relationships. You know, when you're a team member, um, you are sort of a participant. You're a recipient of, of the, the, the leader's, you know, interactions with you. But now suddenly you become the team leader. Now you're, you are the supervisor. And so now there's a different expectation. You need to be the one who initiates. You don't wait for somebody else to reach out to you. You are the one who kind of puts your hand out and kind of includes people into the organization, into the, into the mix. Uh, and in terms of the relationships that your team has with all the other teams inside your company, uh, as the leader, you you need to kind of be the one that really sets the standard and says, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna work collaboratively, cooperatively with other people," and you set the you set the pattern 
of, of building strong, warm, positive relationships within the organization. Joe? That's a great skill to develop. The next one is establish stretch goals. As an individual contributor, it was all about you. And you set stretch goals for yourself. <laughs> but setting them for others and getting people to embrace a stretch goal, that's tough. And that's a whole different process. And, and we've found that this competency is incredibly valuable and important because leaders who know how to get their team to stretch, to, to do more than it's expected, to sort of really give 100%. The funny thing about it is, is that leaders that learn how to do this actually have higher engagement, higher satisfaction with the direct reports. People want to do something that's amazing, but learning that skill of getting people to take on challenging uh, issues and really being more productive, that is a great skill to learn and, and, and it's different set of uh, behaviors. The fifth uh, behavior that we've, we've focused on is one that we've labeled develops strategic perspective. Um, you know, when you're an individual contributor, it's probably important that you understand what the organization's uh, main, you know, uh, strategy is, and and where what what the important initiatives that are going on. But when you become a manager, uh, you need to then kind of move forward to really helping the people around you to to understand more precisely how that strategy impacts your team and your work. You know, I have a son who who teaches strategy at a university and. Uh, it's interesting how the thinking about strategy is changing to some degree. And that is, it's really realizing that strategy consists of a whole bunch of, of small decisions that happen at the team level, happen at the department level, happen at a division level. It isn't just the corporate strategy. And, and what you're trying to decide is, what's unique about what my team does? What are we doing that's clearly differentiates us and how can I be sure that the people on my team really understand what does make us different what makes us unique it also means being able to see you know what's the big picture what's what's happening within our industry what's happening within the economy how is that impacting what we what, what we do so this this ability to think with a a bigger picture and see the patterns is something that can be begin to be developed while people are individual contributors. And when they do really helps them in their role as a manager in the future. You know, the next one, Jack, is this uh, learning agility. And what's fascinating is that as an individual contributor, people realize that they, they need to be open to feedback, that their boss is going to give them some feedback and, and they need to ask for feedback. But when they get moved to a managerial role, they think, oh, that's, I don't need feedback anymore. Now I'm the person giving the feedback. And boy, that's all wrong. And what we find in our data is, is that that openness and what we call coachability declines between an individual contributor and a manager. And, and it shouldn't, it should increase. And, and this ability to sort of think about, I need feedback, I need to, to be open to feedback, and I need to ask for feedback. This is a critical skill for, for people moving into the managerial role. And, and so keep asking for feedback. That's the key to learning agility. The seventh has to do with communications. Um, clearly, being a good communicator is important when you're an individual contributor as well as when you're a manager. But the nature of that communication probably changes to some degree. As an individual contributor, you can be kind of the recipient of, of communication. And yes, you need to listen carefully and understand 
But when you become a manager, it begins to change. Now you are the one who needs to initiate conversations and initiate communication. You need to listen empathetically to the concerns and problems that people on your team are facing. You need to learn to kind of help them to adapt. And so the, the nature of the communication changes as you move from an individual contributor to a manager. But the skills that you learn as an individual contributor really then do feed in to helping you be the more the more effective manager in in your future. Joe? And the last one is this champions change. And again, as an individual contributor, you are expected to support the change, right? So I'll do it. As a leader, you need to be the champion. You need to market it. You need to sort of get others to market it and, and, and accept it and push people along. You need to be that inspiring person that helps them to kind of lead forward. So, you know, this, this move from sort of like going along to really being a champion for the change effort, it makes a big difference and it's a different role. And that's what leaders are expected to do. All right. So we very much appreciate your having kind of joined us today in this webinar. And as we've thought about it, we, we would think there may be two or three things that you might want to consider as action steps that might follow. We've talked a lot about the age at which we begin helping people in their development. We would suggest to you that you might want to think about analyzing the age of the participants in your organization when they participate in various development programs. And think about, you know, what's our ideal target number? Are we happy when if the average age is 46? Or do we want to begin back when people are in their late 20s when often they're put in their first supervisory role? Uh, the second thing we'd like to suggest to you is that may be useful to kind of interview some of the people who have been promoted lately from being an individual contributor into some kind of role as a team leader or a supervisor or a manager and find out from them what would have helped them the most as they made that transition. So just do a little study of, of what, you know, what's happened, a little bit of field research. And the final suggestion we would pass on to you is you may want to just think about people that you know in your organization who strike you as being really unusually capable, talented individual contributors who seem to be held in high regard by their managers. And see if you can propose their involvement in your company's development programs. And if you can kind of begin to, to kind of, you know, un, open the tap and, and help them become part of that leadership pipeline by encouraging uh, and fostering their, their participation in your development pro programs. Joe? Well, let's go through. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, here we're. Final poll here. We're, yeah. As, as you think about these eight things that we've talked about that, that are real opportunities for individual contributors, we would like to know from you which of these sort of strikes you as being the most uh, useful, the most important, which of these uh, eight competencies are high on your list. So, if you would please just weigh in, what would be the four that maybe would be most important to you? They're all important, Jack. <laughs> yeah, tough. well, we know that from a from our statistics, uh, but uh, we we are uh, curious about what you what do you think, Joe? Well, I think the develops others is so obvious, you know, that that, that goes on, but. But uh, strategic is is really important. You know, people aren't expected to be strategic in individual contributor roles, and 
that's something that we know is very critical in a managerial role. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, let's see what the data says here. Okay. Develops others, like you suggested, is very high. Um, yeah. Thank you. So that is the that is the highest one and strategic perspective. Yeah. Develops others. Yeah. Communicates communicates powerfully and perfectly. That maybe that's the highest one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No. Develops yeah. others is the highest. Okay. Well, thank you very much for for your weighing in on those, and uh, we uh, hope that our kind of review of these with you has given you insights and thoughts and some motivation to do something about that. You know, we want to close with a quote from Warren Bennis. Warren Bennis, uh, he was a professor. Uh, he was, uh, you know, a writer. He was a real uh, champion of leadership. Uh, and he said, the most dangerous leadership myth is that leaders are born, that there's a genetic factor to leadership. This myth asserts that people simply either have certain charismatic qualities or not. That's nonsense. In fact, the opposite is true. Leaders are made rather than born. And we believe that. And we believe that there's a leader in you and all of your direct reports. And it, sometimes it needs a little help in terms of coming out. And that's why these 19 competencies are so beneficial because we found you only need to be good at really three of them to be a successful leader. Here's what we know about leadership. We know that with better leaders, turnover is reduced. We know that customer satisfaction is increased. And we know that employee engagement increases significantly along with discretionary effort. Our belief is that the cost of developing leaders is free because the value that better leaders produce it more than pays for any of the cost that goes along, but organizations function better. So here's our special offer to you. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to develop future extraordinary leaders now. And our experience, our, our customers have experienced all these uh, benefits from uh, better leadership effectiveness. One of the things we'd like to do is offer you and your organization a conversation with myself or Jack to discuss your leadership development plans. And the exit survey, if you're interested in this, please indicate your interest in that exit survey. We'd love to share our, we, we meet with hundreds of clients and we have some perspectives. I think we can give you a way to really increase your leadership effectiveness without increasing your costs very much. But we can we can help you do that and we'd love to, to chat with you. Uh, it's limited to five organizations, so just be aware of that. Uh, now, we'd love your feedback. Feedback is important to us and I always read the feedback from these, so please do the survey. Uh, it should launch in your chat. You should have that link that comes up just in case uh, it doesn't automatically launch. Uh, we're going to give away five copies of the trifecta of trust to, to randomly selected uh, people on the call, but we'd uh, love to hear from you. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. And Really, we'd love your, your, your feedback in terms of this whole issue of developing individual contributors and the value that brings to the organization. So thank you so much for participating and see you again in a month.